Well, hello again. In the previous video, we talked about the Ohm's law and resistance. What we are going to do in this video is we are going to introduce resistivity and we will take a look at the microscopic view of the electric current. Once we are done with those, we are going to end this chapter with a brief discussion of the electric power. So let's start with resistivity. It was shown experimentally that the resistance of a wire is actually directly proportional to the length of the wire and inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the wire. So if you have a wire like this, let's say this is, this is the length of the wire and this is the cross-sectional area of the wire. If the current is running in this direction, let's say, so what this means is this is at a higher potential than this side. So resistance of the wire is apparently directly proportional to the length and inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area and the proportional to constant is rho here. Note that this L is the length of the wire along the current flow and this area is the cross-sectional area that is basically perpendicular to the flow of the current. And this constant of proportionality rho is actually called resistivity. Resistivity which apparently has the units of, now this guy has units of ohms, you have meters here, meters squared here, so in order to have ohm here, the resistivity should have the units of ohm meters. This expression actually kind of makes sense because the resistance in these wires is due to the scattering of the electrons from the atoms that makes up this wire. So. Uh, if the current is flowing this way, we know that the electrons will be flowing this way, right? And here is the motion of one of the electrons that are contributing to the electric current. So as you can see, it's going to go through many collisions as it is moving in this direction. The more collisions you are going to have, the larger the resistance. So if one increases the length of the wire, what will happen is you are going to increase the chances of these collisions. So it makes sense for the resistance to increase with length and if you increase the cross-sectional area you will have more electrons that are free to take part in conduction because what you did by increasing the cross-sectional area is essentially increase the matter, the number of atoms who can have one of their electrons free as well. So what that means is for the same potential difference now you will have more charges to move corresponding to a larger current, resulting in a smaller resistance. For example, if you double the cross-sectional area, you double the number of electrons that can take part in conduction, which means you half the resistance. So the larger the cross-sectional area, the smaller the resistance. Now let's talk about this resistivity here. It's a constant for a given material. So all wires that are made out of the same material, let's say gold, will have the same resistivity. But their resistances will be different depending on their dimensions. Here is a table from our textbook, uh, Giancoli from chapter 25. And you can see the conductors, the metals, have resistivities in the order of 10 to the minus 8, whereas the insulators have resistivities that are in the order of 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 12 and we have the semiconductors somewhere in between with resistivities ranging from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the 1 and they do have variable resistivities because you can actually play with the resistivities of these guys by a process called doping so you can dope these guys with different atoms to change their electrical properties so the smaller uh, the resistivity, the better conductor a material is. Sometimes uh, another quantity, another physical quantity is used to talk about how good of a conductor a material is, which is called conductivity. And conductivity is actually nothing but 1 over the resistivity. So the unit for that, the unit for that will be obviously ohm meters to the minus 1. So with this, the larger the conductivity, the better conductor the material is. 
if you pay attention to the table, you will see a third column here that is called temperature coefficient alpha. This quantity is actually telling us how does the resistance or the resistivities of these materials change as a function of temperature. If you have a positive alpha, it means that the resistance of the material will increase with increasing temperature. And if alpha is negative, it means that the resistance of the material will decrease with increasing temperature. And again, this makes sense because when it comes to conductors, the most important factor affecting the resistance is the scattering of the electrons from the atoms because you have a sea of free charges. And these atoms that makes these wires up actually are not at rest. They are in constant motion. They are oscillating back and forth around an equilibrium position. And the higher the temperature gets, the faster they move, increasing the number of collisions with the electrons, which will result in an increase in resistance. Whereas when it comes to semiconductors, in semiconductors you do not have as many free electrons that can contribute to the electric current as you would have in conductors. But as the temperature increases, what happens is you will get more electrons free to contribute, resulting in a decrease in resistance. And this property of materials, meaning having resistances changing with temperature, gives engineers a possibility to employ them as thermometers. And this expression that quantifies the temperature dependence of resistivity can be used for small temperature changes for this purpose. Here, rho zero is the resistivity of the temperature at a known temperature T0, and rho is the resistivity of the material at an unknown temperature T. And alpha here is our temperature coefficient here. So by simply measuring the resistivity, we can figure out what the temperature should be. And also if the effects of thermal expansion or contraction is negligible, we can uh, actually replace these resistivities with the resistances since they are simply proportional to each other. All right, now let's solve a very simple example and start talking about the microscopic view of the electric current. Apparently, in this problem, we have a wire of resistance R. So let's say our wire looks like this, with a length of L and cross-sectional area A. And also, what is given to us is that the resistance of this wire is R. And the question is, what would be the new resistance if we were to stretch it to twice of its original length? Now, we all know the equation relating the resistance to the dimensions of the wire, which is rho times L over A. If you simply pay attention to this expression and just focus on the length, you may think that since we are doubling the length, the resistance will double with it. But it is not really as that simple because when we change the length here, since the density of the material should remain constant, as well as the total mass, since we are not creating extra mass here, the cross-sectional area should also change with changing length. So since we are not changing, maybe we can write an expression like that. The initial mass must be equal to the final mass. We did not change these. And you know how to find the masses, which is density times the volume. This should be equal to the density times the new volume. Let's call it volume prime. Since we are saying that the density is not changing, these densities will go away. And what we are going to find is, how do you find the volume of a cylinder? It is the area of the base times the height, which is going to be then A times the length must be equal to the new area times the new length. But I know what new length is, which is 2 times the original length. So we are going to have A prime times 2L here. And if you solve this for the area, the new area, you are going to find that it's going to be half of the original cross-sectional area. So with these uh, values now, we can calculate the new resistance. The new resistance will be equal to, let's call that R prime, rho times L prime divided by A prime, which is rho times 2L divided by A over 2. And this is going to give us, you can take this two up, 4 times rho times L over A. 
But rho times L over A is our original resistance. So apparently, by stretching this wire twice its original length, we are going to increase the resistance four fold. We are going to quadruple the resistance. All right, now let's move on to the microscopic view of the electric current. Let's consider a piece of wire again. And imagine that we apply a voltage across this wire so that this side is at a higher potential than this side, which means we are going to have an electric current flowing in this direction. And also, just as what we said before, the electrons are actually moving in the opposite direction while going through many collisions, just like this electron does. But before we go ahead any further, I guess we should take a little break here and mention that even in the absence of a voltage across a wire, these electrons are not at rest. They are actually moving in random directions with speeds not so small, actually in the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 meters per second at room temperature due to the thermal energy, obviously. But since all of these electrons are moving in totally random directions, there is no net moment of charge in a particular direction and hence we don't have an electric current. But the moment we apply a voltage, there will be a net motion of these electrons in the direction that is opposite to the electric field inside the conductor. What? Electric field inside a conductor? I can almost hear you guys asking this question. And that is true, we said that there is no electric field in a conductor, but in the static case. What we mean is, let's quickly remember what we said, if there is an electric field in a region, and if you place a conductor in that region, what will happen is, the electrons within the conductor will feel a force that is in the opposite direction to the electric field, and they will start to accumulate on this side, and leaving the positive charges on this surface. And since this is very similar to the parallel plate setup, there will be an electric field induced here, which is going to be in the opposite direction. And this charge separation will continue until these two electric fields cancel each other out. And you get zero electric field inside. But what happens in here is that these charges are in constant motion. They are not going to stop here. They will keep moving. Remember, this is part of a circuit, which is a loop and the charges are in constant motion on this loop. So however many charges leaving from this end, you will have that many charges coming in from this end, and you can never achieve a charge separation, which means there will be no induced electric field here to cancel out the original electric field that is created by the potential difference applied on the conductor. Remember, the electric field is in the direction of decreasing electric potential. Hence, Inside the conductor, in this case, we are going to have an electric field pointing this way. Okay, hopefully, now that we all agree on the presence of the electric field as well as its direction, let's go ahead and define any physical quantity which is called the current density. I'm going to use letter J for that, which is going to be a vector, by the way. So let's just write it here, current density. It's magnitude. Let's just write it like this, or maybe we can call it just J is going to be equal to I over the cross-sectional area of the wire if, if I is uniform. What does that mean is the current is flowing through this cross-sectional area, right? If it is equally distributed over this area, then we call the current uniform. By the way, the unit for current density is, since it is giving us current per unit area, amperes per meter squared. As you can get the current density, if you know the current and the cross-sectional area, you can also go the other way around, meaning if you know the current density and the cross-sectional area, you can easily calculate the current running through the wire as J times the area. Okay, now that we covered the magnitude of the current density, what about the direction? After all, we said that it's a vector, and the current density will be in the same direction as the electric field vector. So let's just write it here. J is in the direction of the electric field. By the way, if the current is not uniformly distributed over this cross-sectional area, 
to calculate the total current running through the wire, what we need to do is to go through the integral route, in which what we do is we divide this uh, area into infinite small pieces. Through each, we calculate the current running by j dot dA, add them up, and calculate the total current. Now that we define the current density, let's see how fast these electrons are moving in this direction. What is their velocity? This velocity is actually called the drift velocity because the electrons are drifting in the opposite direction to the electric field because of the electric force, obviously, while still also having those random velocities we talked about earlier due to thermal energy. And usually, this random velocity is way larger than the drift velocity. Okay, now that we know what we are talking about when we say drift velocity, let's see if we can get an expression for it. Let's have a look at the same wire again, on which the electrons are now moving towards this direction with the drift velocity. Now, also consider the portion of the wire that is shown here, whose length is L. At this instant, let's say we have a free charge of delta Q here. This is the charge of the free electrons that I have within this volume. I am not talking about the atoms here. I am only talking about the charge of the free electrons that are within this volume. If I know this delta Q and the time it takes for this much charge to leave this volume, let's call that delta T, then the electric current will be equal to, let's just write it here, I is equal to delta Q over delta T. If it is hard to visualize what's going on here, uh, remember, as the current flows, what's happening is the electrons within this volume will leave this volume and you will have more electrons go into the volume. All right, now how can I find this delta Q? If we know the free electrons per unit volume within this wire, Let's call that n, then delta Q will be equal to n times the volume of this uh, space we chose, times the volume. Now, note that this is not the charge of the free electrons that we have within this space. It is just the number of electrons that we have here. So if I want to get the charge, all I need to do is multiply this with the charge of the electron, which is negative E. All right, so we have the charge, and I need to divide this guy by delta T. But what is this volume? After all, this is a cylinder, and we know how to find the volume of a cylinder, which is the area times the height here. So this is going to be equal to N times the cross-sectional area times the length times negative E divided by delta T. Now I want to uh, focus on this L here. Remember, delta T is the time for all the electrons that we had here initially to leave this space. So if you consider the electron here, and if it is velocity is the drift velocity, then this L will be equal to nothing but drift velocity times delta T. So we can put this guy in here. And this is going to give us the current to be N times A times V drift times delta T times negative E. And I need to divide this guy by delta T again. And these delta T's will cancel out. And if I take this area to the left hand side, what we are going to get is I over the area, which is, by the way, our current density. Let's call that J, is equal to, we have negative E here, N is left, and the drift velocity is left here. So minus N times E times the drift velocity we got. So if you know your uh, current, the cross-sectional area, and the density of free electrons in your uh, conducting wire, you can easily calculate your drift velocity. The negative sign here has something to do with the vector nature of the current density and the drift velocity. So if we were to express this as a vector equation, we should write it as the current density is equal to minus n times e times the drift velocity. 
So this is the equation that relates the current density to the drift velocity. They are in the opposite directions as seen here anyway. Okay, now let's solve a couple of examples and try to understand how to use these expressions. In this problem, we have a copper wire, apparently that's carrying a current of 4 amps. The radius of the wire is given to be 2 millimeters. In part A, it's asking us to determine the current density. And in part B, it's asking us to determine the drift velocity of the free electrons. Finding the current density is quite straightforward. We know that the current density is equal to nothing but the current divided by the cross-sectional area, which is going to be the current divided by, since we will assume that this is going to be a cylindrical wire, the cross-sectional area will be pi times r squared. If we plug in the values here, we will have 4 amps as the current divided by pi times 2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters as our radius. We need to square that. And if you enter these values in a calculator, what you are going to find is the current density is nothing but 3.2 times 10 to the 5 amps per meter squared. So we got our current density. In part B, we need to calculate the drift velocity. We just got the relationship between the drift velocity and the current density, which stated that J is equal to nothing but minus N times E times VD. Since I'm only interested in the drift velocity's magnitude and this minus sign has something to do with the direction, I am going to ignore the minus sign. And when I solve this for the drift velocity, what I'm going to get is J divided by N times the charge of the electron. Now I know what J is, I know what the charge of the electron is, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. I don't know what N is, but a simple Google search of free electron density of copper gives us the number density of free electrons, which is apparently 8.5 times 10 to the 28 electrons per meter cube. But you could have gotten this number by assuming one free electron per copper atom and using the atomic mass and the mass density of the copper as well as the Avogadro's number. But I'm not going to do that. Let's just plug in the numbers and get the value. So it is going to be equal to, we got the current density, 3.2 times 10 to the 5 amps per meter cube divided by 8.5 times 10 to the 28 electrons per meter cube times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb and if you punch in the numbers in a calculator what you're going to get is the drift velocity is nothing but 2.4 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. This is actually a very small velocity. You can convert this to millimeters per second, which is by the way 0 0.024 millimeters per second. Which means with this speed an electron go through a distance of 1 meters in 12 hours. But we know that the moment we flip the switch in our living rooms, the light will come on almost immediately. How can you explain that? All right, so with that puzzle, let's move on to the next problem. In this problem, we have a piece of wire. By the way, this wire must be a part of a complete circuit for me to have a current of I on it. Apparently, this wire is made out of a material whose resistivity is rho. And the question is to determine the electric field within the wire. Now let's see how we can find the electric field. Well, I know how to get the electric field from electric potential. If you want to find the x component of the electric field, all you have to do is take the derivative of the electric potential with respect to x with a minus sign in front, you will get the electric field along the x direction. When I look at this wire, obviously the current will be flowing along the x direction. So let's say this is the direction of the electric current, which means that this end will be at a higher potential than this end, and the electric field will be in the same direction as the electric 
current. So let's draw that here. So this is our electric field. How can we find the magnitude of that? Well, we are going to need to figure out how the electric potential changes as a function of x. From Ohm's law, we know that there must be a voltage across this wire to have this current, right? So let's say that voltage is V0. For the sake of simplicity, this is what I will do. I'm going to say, you know what? The electric potential at the beginning of the wire, let's say, is V0 and the electric potential at the end of the wire is zero so the voltage is v zero obviously and i will ask you guys all right if this is the case what is the electric potential let's say at this point what would you say well you should tell me that i know ohm's law if the portion of the wire here has the resistance of r this portion only then the electric potential at that point must be equal to V0 minus I, that is the current running through the wire, times the resistance of the portion of the wire between this point and the beginning of the wire here. And it must be minus because if it was plus, then it means that this is at a higher potential than this point and the current must have been flowing in the other direction. But I know that the current is flowing this way, so the potential here must be larger than the potential here. So this is going to be equal to V0 minus. Now, if uh, the cross-sectional area here, if the cross-sectional area here is A, then I can write the electric current as J times A. So this is the electric current. And what is R? Well, I know how to calculate R. If this distance is x, then it's going to be equal to rho times the length of the portion here, which is x, divided by the cross-sectional area. Here I use R is equal to rho L over A. Now you have A here, you have A here. Apparently, the electric potential is a function of x along the x-axis is nothing but V0 minus, the a's cancel out, we are going to have J, the current density, times rho, the resistivity, times x. Now, all I have to do is take this guy and put it in here. If I do that, the electric field is equal to minus dv over dx, which is minus. v0 is constant. You take the derivative of that, you will get 0. And if you take the derivative of this with respect to x, what you are going to get is j times rho with a minus sign in front. So what this is telling us is that minus minus will give you a plus. The electric field is nothing but rho times j. Remember, the electric field is a vector. The current density is a vector. So if I were to write this as a vector equation, this is what I should write. Or if you want, you can also express the electric field using conductivity rather than the resistivity, which is going to be then 1 over sigma times j. So we got our electric field. Now let's talk about electric power. Electrical energy is useful to us as we can transform it into other energy forms. For example, an electric car takes the electrical energy and converts it into mechanical energy. Or a light bulb converts it into heat plus the radiated energy in the form of light. And from Physics 101, you remember one definition of power is the rate at which one form of energy is transformed into another one. Now let's consider a simple circuit like this. This R can be a light bulb, for example, and it is apparently connected to a battery here. It is, by the way, going to be our electrical energy source. So we will have a current running through this circuit in this direction. And Va minus Vb will be the voltage across our resistor. 
And you know that the electric potential at point A must be larger than the electric potential at point B so that you will have a current running in this direction. So you will have a drop in electric potential as you move along the resistor. That's why often voltage across a resistor is referred to as potential drop or voltage drop. Now imagine that a very small tiny bit of positive charge DQ goes from point A to point B in the direction of the current. How will the electrical energy change? So let's just write it here, change in electrical energy. We know that it will be an infinitely small change because it's an infinitely small charge moving here. It's going to be equal to, you remember how we find the change in electrical potential energy? It is the moving charge times the change in electric potential. It will see. So it's going to be dq times change in electric potential. This is the final potential minus the initial potential, which is going to be, by the way, vb minus va, which is minus dq times v as v is va minus vb. Now we find a negative value here because the electrical energy is decreasing. Remember, it's being transformed into other forms. So I guess the change in other forms of energy then will be the u is equal to the positive of whatever quantity we got here so it's just going to be positive dq times v remember this is what we are after how fast it is being transformed from here to here now this is the amount of energy we transformed so if i'm interested in the power i need to divide this guy by dt so the power is equal to du over dt, which is going to be dq over dt times v. But I know what dq over dt, this is nothing but the definition of the electric current. So apparently the power is equal to nothing but i times v. So this resistor, let's say it's a light bulb will transform the electrical energy this much per second. This is our power. And for an ohmic device, ohmic device, where the voltage is equal to I times R, then power can be expressed in three different forms. One form is obviously I times V. But what you can do is you can plug I times R for V and you are going to get I squared times R. Or you can express I as V over R and you are going to get V squared over R as the power as well. And the unit for power is what? Or we use letter W for that. Now let's solve a very simple example and end this video lecture. In this problem, what we have is a light bulb that is designed to work at 220 volts and has a power rating of 60 watts. What does this design to work phrase tell us is that you will only get 60 watts if it is connected to 220 volts. If, for example, you connect it to 110 volts, the power you are going to get will not be 60 watts. It will be something else. And the question is for us to calculate the resistance and the current running through the light bulb if it was connected to 220 volts. So in part A, we are after the resistance. And power was equal to I times V or I squared times R or V squared over R. Now which one you would use depends on the problem. If you look at this problem, for example, we know the voltage and we know the power. So it makes sense for us to use this expression to calculate the resistance. So I have power is equal to V squared over R. So if we solve this for R, what we are going to get is V squared over the power, which is 220 volts squared divided by 60 watts and this will give us the resistance which is apparently 807 ohms so we got our 
resistance. And in part B, it's asking us to calculate the current. We can simply make use of Ohm's law here. V is equal to I times R, now that we know the resistance. From here, I will be equal to V over R. We are going to get 220 volts divided by 807 ohms. So this will give us the current, which is apparently 0 0.273 amperes. Of course, if you want it, you could have written as 273 milliamps. Part C is left as a homework to you. If this light bulb is connected to 110 volts instead, would it be brighter or dimmer? All you need to do is calculate the new power output of the light bulb when it is connected to 110 volts and compare it to 60 watts. And lastly, one more homework problem for you. In this problem, you go to a vacation for 10 days after this pandemic is over soon, hopefully and you forgot to turn off your electric oven. See how much would this cost you if you pay 0.71 Turkish Rass per kilowatt hour. Once again, we are at the end of our video lecture. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you later.